Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. He is his own worst enemy. Maybe you've heard that phrase uh, used in reference to perhaps a politician or some other famous person. Especially in, in the internet age, a careless public comment can ruin a person's reputation and, and can even destroy their career in a very short time. This phrase is also true of Christians. As we wind our way through life's twisting and, and often spiritually dangerous and destructive paths, the journey of life. Like the people of Israel that we just heard about in our sermon text, God invites us to follow him and to trust in him, but all too often we, we falter and we fail. When that happens, the blame can only be laid at our own feet for our failure, for falling into sin and temptation. We, we wish it were not so. We know that Jesus has crushed the serpent's head, crushed the devil's head by his death on the cross, and yet that serpent still comes back at us in vengeance. And, and God says in another metaphor that he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour us, to utterly destroy us by leading us into sin and leading us away from faith in Jesus. The sinful temptations of the world around us entice us and tempt us to sin. Our sinful nature that still lives within each one of us yearns to be free. It, 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 it hates being under the obligation of God's law and the constraints of God's law. With God's help, we fight and the struggle goes on against sin and temptation day by day. God gives us his almighty word as a powerful weapon for defense against those temptations and even to go on offense against those temptations of the devil. In verse 6 of our reading, the Apostle Paul tells us that these things, these things that we read about that happened to the Israelites in the Old Testament, took place as examples to warn us not to desire evil things. Maybe you've heard this famous saying from the philosopher George Santayana, even if you don't know that it's he who said it. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And that's certainly very true. And so it's good for us today to learn from those tragic events of ancient Israel's history so that we do not repeat those same mistakes in our lives as Christians. The Apostle Paul was writing these words to Christians in the, the Greek city of Corinth. They were surrounded by all kinds of worldly evil. If you read up a little bit on, on ancient Corinth, you'll find out just how, how disgusting and, and despicable the very often public acts of, of sin and evil were in Corinth at that, at that time. And the Apostle Paul writes to them to remind them and, and encourage them that they were by no means the first people of God to have to fight against temptation, and sin, both around them and also within themselves. And so he reminds them of those battles that ancient Israel had against sin. But God demonstrated repeatedly with, with his marvelous signs and with his miracles and powerful acts that God was there with his people, with the people of Israel, to uphold them as they fought against those temptations to sin. God first led the people out of slavery in Egypt after performing ten miraculous plagues that, that wreaked havoc on the unbelieving Pharaoh and, and people of Egypt. And finally, God led them out, and while Pharaoh's army was pursuing them, God protected them. He led them to safety through the waters of the Red Sea, parting the waters so they could cross through on dry ground. And God continued to guide and, and guard them as he led them in the form of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And as they were there in, in, in journeying through the wilderness, God miraculously provided food for them, sending manna from heaven and miraculously providing water for them. Uh, a couple of times, water coming from a rock miraculously. Paul says that that rock symbolizes Christ. 
that it really was Christ himself who gave them that miraculous nourishment. But the most important kind of nourishment that God gave to them was nourishment for their souls, strengthening for their faith, their faith in God's promise to send the Savior in the future. And so through their faith in that promise, that Savior, Jesus, was with them there at that time. However, in spite of all of those blessings from God, the Apostle Paul says in verse 5 of our reading, Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. He had them die in the wilderness. Why wasn't God pleased with them? Paul goes on in the next several verses of our reading to explain the evil things that the Israelites did that brought judgment on them from God. They worshipped false gods. Not long after the true God had rescued them from Egypt, they, they were impatient when Moses was up on Mount Sinai, receiving the law from God, and and so after only a a short period of time of Moses being away, they demanded Moses' brother Aaron to make an idol, a statue of of a golden calf for them to worship. And as part of that uh, idolatrous worship, they also committed acts of adultery and fornication, sexual immorality, very openly and publicly. They put God to the test. They grumbled and complained against him. They they said that they would be better off even being back in the land of slavery in Egypt rather than having been brought out into the wilderness to wander. Paul writes that all those things serve as warnings for us. Since we live at a time that, that Jesus has completed his work of salvation, and when Jesus could now come back again at any time, for the last judgment. Elsewhere, Paul wrote to the Christians in the Macedonian city of Philippi, Philippians chapter 3, he said, Many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. I told you about them often, and now I am saying it while weeping. Their end is destruction. Their God is their appetite, and their glory is in their shame. They are thinking only about earthly things. And how true that is of people still today, 2,000 years after the Apostle Paul wrote those words. That our society, our our world is full of people who who their their only goal, their their only purpose in life is to seek gratification of the flesh, of, of the sinful nature and its desires, regardless of whatever consequences might come for themselves or for other people. And that's certainly very evident in the the epidemic of, of drug use and abuse, and drunkenness, and widespread sins of, of sexual promiscuity and perversion. If it feels good, do it. That's the motto of our present era. But that leaves behind in its wake a huge swath of destroyed and ravaged lives by sin and its consequences. At the time of the Exodus and of Israel's subsequent wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because of their idolatry and their sexual immorality, the Apostle Paul says that 23,000 of them fell. They, They died as judgment on their sins and went to hell. And others died, others of them died when God sent poisonous snakes among them in judgment for their grumbling and complaining against him and his goodness in saving them and providing for them but they weren't satisfied with what God had provided. God's judgment judgment still comes today on sin and on rebellion against his will. Paul warned elsewhere in his letters to the the Christians in Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 5, he said, Do not let sexual immorality, any kind of impurity or greed, even be mentioned among you as is proper for saints. Obscenity, Foolish talk and coarse joking are also out of place. Instead, give thanks. Certainly you are aware of this. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ, who is God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. It is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. So do not share in what they do. We, today, need that same admonition that the Apostle Paul 
wrote to those Christians in the city of Ephesus. We need it not only because of the open sin in our society, the sin in, in the world around us, but also because that sin in the world around us can and does affect us also. We also are vulnerable to the sinful temptations of this world. So God wants us to be on guard and to fight against those temptations to sin. Satan, the tempter, the accuser, came to the Israelites in the Old Testament and he tempted them, he, he attacked them, not at their strongest point, which was the, the leadership that God had provided through Moses who, who relayed God's own word to the people, but he attacked them at their weakest point, the desires of the sinful nature that live within them. Satan baits the hook of, of each individual temptation according to the appetites and, and the weaknesses of each individual person. Martin Luther observed, Satan is like a hunter. He wrings the necks of most birds, but a few he leaves for decoys. And so Christians today will observe uh, obvious, uh, re openly rebellious, sinful people prospering and seemingly enjoying their sinful ways and, and not reaping any consequences or judgment, apparently, as a result of their sin. So we'll be tempted by those things we observe to go and, and follow in that same sinful path, for, forgetting the warning that God spoke in Romans chapter 6 that the final result of those things is death. The Apostle Paul offers many words of encouragement from God and reminders of who we are and what God has done for us as we fight those battles against sin and temptation. God has this precious word written to warn us. The Apostle Paul writes in verse 11, us to whom the end of the ages has come. Yes, we are in the end time. We have seen the fulfillment of God's promised salvation Jesus' death on the cross for, in payment for our sins and his resurrection of, from the dead. And so God tells us that now that that salvation has been completed, the end of the world could come at any time. And when the end does come, we will leave this sinful world and live with God in heaven. And so God calls on us to be ready, to be ready for that return of, G of Jesus and the final judgment. God assures us that no matter what temptation, no matter what testing or trial may come, that he is faithful. He promises that he will not abandon us in that time of trial and testing. And he keeps his promises. He is the God who has always existed and who never changes. He is faithful to his promises. He enables us to bear up and to resist those temptations to sin that we face. To refuse to sin. Now, of course, it's, it's never easy to fight against the devil, to fight against the, the temptations of the sinful world around us, especially to fight against our own sinful nature and its desires living within us. We know that that battle never ends until our life on this earth is over. The Apostle Paul wrote, about the Israelites as having been baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and of eating and drinking spiritually from Christ. And of course, that as a, a foreshadowing or, or a picture of the ways that God gives his grace to us in, in tangible, in real ways, not just in symbolic or metaphorical ways. First, in, in the washing of baptism. God makes us his own. He adopts us into his family as his dear sons and daughters through Jesus. And he gives us his word, which is a living and active, a powerful two-edged sword that he gives us to wield, to defend against the attacks of the devil and to go on the offense against him. He feeds us the precious food of forgiveness in the Lord's Supper, when we receive the body and blood of Jesus to assure us of the full forgiveness of all of our sins. And so through these means of grace, forgiven, renewed, and strengthened, we can do what Jesus calls us to do, to daily take up our cross 
our cross of self-denial, of, of denying and resisting all those temptations to sin, of bearing whatever burdens we have in life, especially the, the burdens, the challenges, and the opposition that comes as followers of Jesus in this society that, that by and large rejects Jesus. We take up that cross by the strength that God gives us, and we follow Jesus day by day. Yes, that, that daily cross-bearing as we follow Jesus is itself a battle because our sinful nature living within us wants nothing more than, than to throw off that cross, to get rid of that burden. And the new man living within us, the, the believer in Jesus as our Savior, wants the opposite of what the sinful nature wants. And so there is a, a daily struggle within us. But God calls on us to fight that battle and not to settle for anything less than victory. And so as we fight that battle against sin each day, we must understand that it is a, a total commitment to battle, to fight, and to win against those temptations to sin. But of course, our, our daily frustration is that we never totally win in this life. Each day brings a new battle, new temptations to sin, and each day we win some of those battles and we also lose some of those battles, sometimes falling so pitifully short of the standard of perfection that God demands that, that we can simply only join together with the Apostle Paul in his cry of desperation that he writes about in Romans chapter 7. What a miserable wretch I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? The Apostle Paul then goes immediately to supply his own answer, which is also the answer for us as well. I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus has won the victory for us. When we fail, he did not fail. And he supplies and gives and credits that victory of his to us, to our account in God's sight. If ancient Israel, the Israelites, had been faithful to God in the way that God had been faithful to them, the Israelites would have faced those temptations to sin and, and relying on God's help and the strength that he provides, they would have overcome those temptations. Through God's word and through the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, by that grace and power of God, God comes to us with his gracious promise of full forgiveness of our sins and of eternal salvation. When temptation comes, he invites us to watch and pray. He promises to hear our prayers and to deliver us from all attacks on us in our faith. Yes, he assures us that in this life, because of sin in the world and within us, temptations will come in this life. And God's word tells us the plain reality that, yes, we will fall into sin. But God assures us that his son, who led a perfect life in our place and who suffered an innocent death in our place on the cross, has already paid in full and taken away all of those sins of ours. That our perfect Savior will continue to lead us each day, just as he led Israel through their wandering in the wilderness. Our Savior Jesus will lead us through life in this world to the promised land of heaven. And so as we think back on those struggles, the, those weaknesses of the Israelites in the Old Testament, we reflect on our situation today also. We see that, yes, fighting temptation today is no easier than it was thousands of years ago at the time of Moses and the Israelites. Temptations lurk within us, urging us to give up or to see how much we dare to try to get away with uh, testing and, and, and pressing the line, seeing how far we can go before God's wrath is kindled and his judgment comes upon us. Satan uses those temptations and he, he sows the seeds of doubt and, and lies in our hearts. Nothing really has changed in essence, only that the names and the dates have changed. Temptation is here. The battle against it must be fought. If the Israelites had followed the Lord instead of rebelling, they would have entered the promised land of Canaan. 
But instead, temptation led to open rebellion against God and his will, and so ultimately it led to the death of all of that generation of Israelites without entering the promised land of Canaan. As we follow Christ, God promises us that we will be victorious when temptation comes, and even in death, because, as the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy, if we have died with him, with Jesus our Savior, we will also live with him. Through baptism, we are connected to Jesus Our our old self, our sinful nature, dies together with Jesus in his death on the cross. And a new self is raised within us. A new self that desires to follow God and his will in our lives. And so assured and strengthened through God's word and through his promises and assurance of forgiveness of our sins in in baptism and the Lord's Supper, we are assured of the, the, the sure victory that he has given to us through Jesus our Savior. And so certain of that victory, let's keep on fighting against temptation. Amen.